Hi everyone and welcome back to another video of Kiwi Investments. This week we are going to do something different and we are going to look at a financial statement that was released this week and that is from Kathmandu. Kathmandu has gotten very popular among Kiwi investors for some reason. So I thought we would briefly go through the financial statement together and understand what it is showing. Understanding financial statements is important part of investing because you can read a financial statement yourself and come up with your own reason as to why you should invest or not invest in a company rather than listening to someone else saying it's a good idea. This video would be like a brief introduction to a video series I got planned to come out so make sure you have subscribed to get that notification when those videos come out. Okay the first section of an annual report is usually an introduction to the company. Most experienced investors would know what the company is about but they might still be interested in this section to see what has changed and Kathmandu has made some changes which we will look at soon. New investors or experienced investors looking for new companies Companies, this might be especially useful because most companies do way more than what people initially think they do. So Kathmandu holding consists of three brands, Kathmandu, Rip Curls and Obos. Much like how the warehouse group is made out of the warehouse, the warehouse stationery, no limits, torpedo 7, one day and the market. Most beginner investors only think of the warehouse and the warehouse stationery. Anyways back to Kathmandu. You can read about what each of them brings to the table. Now if you go down, you can see that they have transformed their operations over the years and Kathmandu has a much bigger global presence. If I zoom out a bit and dig in deeper, you can see that Australia and New Zealand obviously dominate this with 270 stores in the region. Now if you look at other parts of the world, South America, Africa, Middle East and also Asia, there are no Kathmandu stores. Europe and North America has one online store each. So most of this global reach painted in this pretty picture is due to the recent acquisition of Rip Curls. But if you would have come up here and read what they have planned for Kathmandu, they said that they are well positioned for international expansion post COVID-19. Okay, let's come down past the global reach and on to performance highlights. So the performance highlight section of the report is where the company lists out all the key achievements or specific initiatives of the past year. Performance highlights is exactly what it sounds like. They like to put big bold letters and all kinds of graphics to highlight whatever achievements they have made. This is something I find really interesting as although the figures and information given looks really good, most times it may hide other relevant factors of their financial performance for the year. I'll explain this later on when we get to interpreting some of their earnings results. Some of their accomplishments, their operating cash flow numbers were up and they had an increase in group sales close to 50%. Kathmandu has also highlighted the negative impacts of COVID-19 on their business. No point in hiding that because that's what's in every investor's mind. Their profitability has had a significant decline with the underlying net profit after tax reducing by 44.5%. We will review the profit figures in more details when we get to their income statement. Going down for now, on the next page we have the CEO and the chairman's letter which is a good read to have an insight to what the company has dealt with over the year and what their responses have been to any significant events. You can have a read of it if you want. Now lots of companies these days are increasing their sustainability reporting. In short, this highlights the activity of the company which contributes to cultural, social and environmental aspects of the economy. It's a section to show off their performance and a way to build relationships with various stakeholders. It's to train people. I have always told investors to go with the trend and guess what? Businesses are doing the same. If a company shows that they don't care about the environment or people, then a whole lot of investors won't want to put their money in with that company. Companies with the focus on around environmental impacts have continued to go up. Tesla and Meridian are great examples of this. It's the way of the future. But of course, it's not the only reason why these companies have continued to go up. Back to the financial statement. Companies can also use this section to impress investors. For example, Main Freight is a logistic company that is talking about capturing the rainfall on the roof of their buildings to wash their trucks. In this way, they will be saving money on the water bills and it's better for the environment. These kind of things really do impress investors. Okay, so some of Kathmandu's highlights were having the first solar panel store in Australia, increased their recycling, and also received certification for embracing diversity and inclusion in the workplace. Let's move down to the next page. The acquisition of Rip Curls near the end of November last year was big news for Kathmandu and it looks like it has contributed to a large proportion of their revenue despite being operational for only 9 months. And on the next page, they have placed quite a bit of emphasis on some of their product launches. You can read about it if you want. The next session shows what's happening with the other two brands. Just like with Rip Curls, you can have a read if you're interested. Now this page shows who the board members and the management team is. 
Now think of an election. During an election, when you vote for a party to run your country, you look at who is in that party because they are the ones that will make decisions on your behalf. Well, much like that, it's how businesses work as well. When you put your money into a company, you are basically putting money on these people to say that they will make the right decisions for you. Remember, these are the guys that are in charge of the company and the direction of the company which you are putting your money into. Now you can Google most of these guys to see what their history is and what they have done in the past, especially CEO. Goals. Because most of the time, board members bring in CEOs from outside of the company to bring in fresh new ideas and talent. I talked about Greg Foran in this channel before and how I am excited to see what he does with Air New Zealand because he did outstanding work with Walmart. Anyways, let's come back and let's keep moving on. And now we move on to the good stuff, the financial statement. And let me just zoom in a bit. Consolidated statement of comprehensive income, also called the profit and loss statement, is the first one we will be looking at. So let's look at what it contains and what these key figures actually mean. This statement summarizes how much income or revenue the company has earned over the reporting period, and most importantly, how much it costs to earn that income. When reviewing a specific section of a statement, it is helpful to go over the section or note number next to it, as this provides you with a breakdown of what that amount is made up of and any other relevant information that goes with it. So as you can see, Katmandu had reported sales as 801 million for 2020. Remember, these figures are in millions. So that's a very decent increase from 2019. And you can read over section 2.2 to see what that is made up of. So let's go and find that. Here we are. So this tells you how Katmandu has recognized their revenues. They made their income from retail sales, online sales, wholesale sales, and so on. So here you can see that they have split the 801 million by the type of revenue and also by the location and the geographical area. Let's come back up to the top where we were. Cost of sale, also known as cost of goods sold, is the cost of producing the goods. It is an expense of how much the company has spent to buy or make the items that were sold. So this can include cost of material, labor or overhead cost. And as I mentioned, you can go to the section notes to see what these costs are. The deduction of cost of sales from the revenue gives us gross profit. This figure alone may not be very relevant in analyzing a company. You can compare this profit from the last year to consider how the business is performing. The the next part of the statement contains operation expenses. Other income is included before this and it is usually made up of things such as government grants. Again, you can see what it is under section 2.2. Okay, back to more expenses. Katmandu has divided their expenses into two categories, selling expenses and administration and general expenses. Selling usually covers all expenses in relation to selling, marketing, service and distributing products. So things such as logistics and advertising cost. Admin and general expenses could include rental expenses salary and wages or other miscellaneous administration and operation expenses. Once we deduct these expenses from the gross profit, we get our earnings before interest, tax, depreciation and amortization, also known as EBITDA. EBITDA. Positive EBITDA. 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 EBITDA positive. EBITDA. EBITDA. Sounds funny, right? So what does EBITDA tell us? It is a measure of profit. However, in my opinion, it provides investors with a glimpse of only their short-term operational efficiency. The EBITDA figure shows how efficient a company is converting their revenue into profits and thereby becomes an indicator of a company's performance. Although some investors might form their opinion using this measure, it excludes financial information that is not directly linked to operational and profitability and that's why it may be misleading. So I would be very cautious when using this as an indicator to make investing decision. You may compare it with another company or maybe look at what the previous year figure was but it may conceal other financial obligations which will impact the entire leverage position. So it excludes debt expenses and it may hide financial shortcomings and it also fails to recognize depreciation and amortization as the name suggests, which is what has happened this year. And you can see, because Katmandu's EBITDA alone looks very impressive, right? 148 million compared to 99 million in 2019. Well, if we look down a bit, the expenses for depreciation and amortization has increased by 87 million from 2019, which has reduced their earnings before interest and tax. You may again read sections 3.2 to 3.4 for further details of why this was the case. Further to this, net financial costs have also risen from 2.9 million to 23 million. Now I'm very curious as to why this is, because this is about 693% increase from last year. So let's go and find section 4.1. So here in this section, we'll explain why that is. 
So in 2020, Kathmandu has taken out $241 million worth of secured loan. This is a massive increase compared to only $25 million last year. And if we have a look at the top here, $237 million of this is to be paid in 2-3 to three years. And below this you can see a further breakdown of the cost. You can see that the interest on lease liabilities and other financial costs have gone up and have contributed to that 693% increase which we saw in the statement. So now you can kind of see how a high EBITDA doesn't necessarily mean good news for investors. It does hold some value for short-term performance. However, it does not reflect the true value of a company's financial position. The next figure we get is profit before income tax. Now this is calculated by everything that we have talked about so far and we can actually do this ourselves. So for example, if we get our calculator out and we started with a gross profit of 467 million. So let's type that in 467031 and we minus the operation expenses. So minus 318 million 140 40,000 hit enter we get our EBITDA amount and if we continue to minus the depreciation value so minus 103 million and 27,000 hit enter you get the earnings before interest and tax and now we had to minus the financial cost which is what we talked about under the section 4.1 so it's the massive debt that they're paying off so if we go ahead and minus the financial cost so minus 23 million 354 hit enter you get your earnings before tax and of course with any income you had to pay tax so the amount Katmandu has paid in Texas is 13 million. So let's go ahead and minus that. Minus 13 million 631,000. Hit enter and we get our profit after tax, which is significantly lower than last year. So that's how profit before income tax and profit after tax is calculated through all these things that we have just talked about. The net profit after tax represents the earnings after all these expenses has been deducted from the revenue. And Kathmandu has about an 85% drop in earnings for 2020 compared with 2019. Now before you go and throw Kathmandu out the window, keep in mind the tough times that we are in. Kathmandu still made a profit, while most other companies haven't been able to make profits due to the pandemic. You can argue about how they made that profit and argue about the massive debt that they're in, but nonetheless, they still made a profit. Financial statements usually compare the most recent period to the last period, but if you want to have a look at more than just two periods, then what I use is Wall Street Journal. When you come to the main page of Wall Street Journal, just search for the company that you are after. When the page loads up, go down to the Financials tab. Income Statement is what we looked at. Balance Sheet and Cash Flow I will go over in a separate video. So click on Income Statement. If you come down a bit, you will see that you get the financial information of the company for the last five years. With this, you can clearly see if a company has been consistent with their revenue growth. So here you have everything that we just talked about, but for five years. So you can compare it with the last five years to determine if a company has made profit consistently. And as you can see, their figures are quite accurate. So the consolidated net income is 8879, which is the same as what we looked at in the financial statement, 8879. One thing that I should point out in Wall Street Journal for their net income, they have included minority interest expense of 734000 so their net income figure is 8145000 Minority interest expense is the non-controlling interest related to Kathmandu's acquisition of rip curls. Moving down, this next part gets a little complicated and I'll explain it in the video series as this video is already getting a bit too long and I will end it here. But before I go, just very quickly, the last part I want to go over is the basic earnings per share. This can be used as a key indicator for investors as it clearly measures the company's performance in terms of profitability. Earnings per share is calculated by dividing the company's profit or the net income by the total number of outstanding shares which is how many shares they have in the market. The higher the earnings per share the better its profitability and investors usually pay more for a company's share. But again it's best not to analyze these figures alone. The earnings per share is used to calculate some important market evaluation ratios which will be covered in the video series. Anyways yes do let me know if you would find a video series on things like this useful to you. This was just a very brief introduction to it. We have only scratched the surface there is so much more to talk about like or comment to let me know subscribe if you haven't done so already and see you in the future videos